Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner, great to have you with us. The ability to monitor every aspect of our lives, seeing every moment in minute detail, is something out of Orwell's futuristic warnings. But it's being played out on our own borders, on the Tono Odom Reservation in Arizona, on the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's being carried out with Israeli technology that was honed on its own separation wall, and is being used by the Customs and Border Protection Agency. It's known by its acronym CPB, and it watches not just the border, but even our own American citizens. In an extensive study published by The Intercept, Will Parrish reveals how the Israeli company Elbit Systems developed technologies which were then procured by CPB to invade the privacy of the Tono Odom people themselves. Media outlets like PBS, ABC News, CBS, others, often report on the Tono Odom Reservation as a weak point in the U.S.-Mexico border, where some of the forces and the focus seems to be on blaming members of the Tono Odom nation for smuggling drugs into the United States. They do extensive reports and interview Customs and Border Protection people all the time, but rarely do they bother to interview any of the people on the res themselves. And here's a rare interview in PPS with Francisco Valenzuela, who's a member of that nation. I would compare the Border Patrol to the Gestapo. Francisco Valenzuela is a member of the Tahana Atam tribe and a rancher. He says he's been harassed repeatedly by Border Patrol agents. Every time I come down here, I experience something. Like what? Well, literally being stopped and being searched and uh, point, point the guns at you. So Put you've had hands guns up. drawn at you? Oh, yeah. Now, Elbit Systems was selected for the contract because it boasts that its technology has been quote-unquote field tested in the occupied Gaza Strip and occupied West Bank and Palestine. Every device which is installed in the United States has been tested against Palestinians first. Moreover, Elbit Systems' business model is not just one of selling cameras or surveillance vehicles, such as drones. It also includes sending teams of Israeli former soldiers to install these devices, train local crews on how to use them, and maintain them over years. This means, it seems, that Israeli citizens are part of collecting data on American citizens without our consent. And we're joined by Will Parrish, an investigative journalist. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including The Intercept, The Guardian, The Nation, East Bay Express, Counterpunch, and many more. He reports regularly on indigenous struggles in this country for justice in the United States. His article, The Intercept, which was published on the 25th of August, is called The U.S. Border Patrol and an Israeli Military Contractor Are Putting a Native American Reservation Under Persistent Surveillance. And we'll welcome, good to have you with us here on The Real News. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. Let's, let's start with, it, with an understanding of how this surveillance really affects the lives of the people on that reservation, on the Tono Odom people themselves, uh, and, and a bit about who they are and what this is about. And you know, proponents of surveillance often argue that if, if you have nothing to hide, then why would you mind being under constant surveillance? What could it hurt? Uh, but talk a bit about that and the res and what's significant about what the, the, what's going on at this moment on that reservation. Right, so the Tahana Otum Reservation is uh, a significant area of, of southern Arizona, and it also you know, straddles uh, it straddles the border essentially on, on either side of the of the Arizona uh, border with the, the Mexican state of Sonora. Uh, it's the third largest reservation in the United States, and so there there's people within the res- within the nation who live on the U.S. side. There's people within the nation who live on the Mexico side uh, who have had their lives intensely disrupted over the past, uh, you know, especially 20 years or so, um, as the the war on immigration has ramped up in the United States and the border has become increasingly militarized. There's been a, a huge surge in border patrol agents um, and personnel and equipment you know, in the reservation, which has led to, you know, intensifying harassment and surveillance of people living there. So kind of the you know, the, the coup de grace of, of surveillance is the development of these integrated fixed towers that are going to literally be able to monitor um, every movement that people make within a 7.5 mile radius of, of each, each individual tower. There will be 10 towers. Um, they're positioned for the most part, close to the border uh, in in fairly remote areas, but some are located right next to residential areas. So, you know, basically anything that anyone is doing living in those areas is are, is going to be captured by these integrated fixed towers, which pipe images and other data back to border patrol command centers, 
uh, in Southern Arizona. And they have a, a, a back in time feature, you know, sort of like a, a TiVo meets Google Earth kind of feature where, you know, basically the, all the images and data are stored and can be uh, pulled up uh, across time so you can so that border patrol agents are able to monitor people's movements over time which is which is essentially what persistent surveillance means is is this ability to uh, tunnel back in time as they say so I, I want to explore a little bit about Elbit systems and about the companies that providing the surveillance technology as an Israeli company um, and so I mean what makes what happened here with Elbit different than other companies I mean they so from what you wrote they attempted to do this for several years beforehand, spent billions of dollars, it did not work, they brought Elbit in. So let's talk about the significance of this relationship between Elbit as an Israeli security company uh, and the militarization of the border. And these things fit together in a kind of a frightening way. Um, I mean, because, well, let me just stop there and let you kind of jump into that one. Yeah, well, as, as you mentioned in your intro, uh, Elbit Systems markets their products as being field proven, uh, quote unquote, uh, on Palestinian people. And so, you know, they they have a lot of experience with these kinds of monitoring operations through having been a lead contractor on Israel's border and separation walls, um, you know, in the Gaza Strip, West Bank, as well as on the northern border of Israel with Lebanon and Palestine on its border with Egypt. You know, Elbit Systems has been involved in all these projects. So they were able to bring that expertise uh, to this project with Customs and Border Protection. And in 2014, uh, Customs and Border Protection was looking for you know, an experienced contractor uh, to run this, this kind of surveillance operation in the wake of a failed attempt by a, a US-based military contractor, Boeing, uh, to get a similar project up and running, uh, it became a huge boondoggle. So Elbit was able to come in and say, hey, we've we've done this before. Um, we are able to do this relatively inexpensively compared to other companies like Boeing. And and they got the contract and they've, you know, based on the, the metrics and ways that the you know Border Patrol is looking at this project, they've been very successful uh, technologically in in accomplishing what Border Patrol is looking for and you know they're poised to expand further. Um, and you know Elbit Systems is interesting because they have a division in the United States mm -hmm. and uh, they do a lot of their sort of cutting edge research and technology development in the United States because they benefit from the United States uh, military aid to Israel which uh, under a condition of the Obama administration's um, aid package to Israel, uh, companies based in the United States have to receive that money. So Elbit Systems actually has an increasing uh, operation in the United States that is tied to uh, the, the use of U.S. military aid money uh, that goes to Israel. That's a really interesting synergistic relationship you're outlining. I think most people are not aware of that all the billions we give to Israel in terms of for its own, for its defense, giving it to its military, this is a reciprocal relationship. If you have to have a company in this country to take some of that aid money to de develop systems for this country's uh, surveillance systems and other things. And that's, a, that's something that's been really, really explored other than what I've seen you try to, uh, do what you're doing in this article. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think most people don't realize that this money that goes to Israel in the name of of uh, you know supposedly deterring terrorism in in that part of the world is actually being used here in the United States to develop technologies that then place in this case people living on U.S. soil under surveillance. And um, so there's there's this you know entire. Um, Relation, you know, this relationship is much more complicated than Very I complicated. And people as you, understand and has a lot more direct impacts than people understand. And as you point out in your article, I mean, the, the Border Patrol has uh, authority 100 miles from the border and the edge of the country on the ocean sides and the border side as well. So it takes in the whole reservation and goes beyond that. That's the majority of people in America really could be end up being under the surveillance of, um, of, of the Border Patrol and the federal government. That's something that we don't think about very much. Right. Yeah. Um, Border Patrol has this authority dating to, um, you know, some sort of obscure piece of legislation that was passed in the 1950s, like you say, to operate within 100 miles of 
uh, the southern border, the northern border, and the coastlines, which um, technically places about two thirds of the United States population under the, um, you know, two thirds of the population is potentially subject to border patrol operations. Uh, mo- you know, most of the way that man- has manifested so far has been through, for example, border patrol checkpoints. Um, you know, b- the border patrol has dozens of checkpoints that they operate across um, that area that, that we just talked about. Um, but they also have this increasingly sophisticated surveillance apparatus. And, and while, you know, of, of course, um, you know, there's many police agencies that engage in intensive surveillance of, of people in the United States. Border Patrol has, you know, probably the most sophisticated of any police agency. So, you know, what, what we've seen in some instances, and, and you know, as I pointed out in the article, in a, in a few cases, um, for example, at Standing Rock, where the police in North Dakota were looking for uh, more intense surveillance um, capabilities, they turned to the Border Patrol's uh, drones uh, in order to enhance their surveillance of, of protesters at Standing Rock. Um, you know, and there's a couple other instances I named in the article. You're, so, you're you know, this, San Diego I think it's an well. studied, kind of underreported aspect of of what the Border Patrol does. Right. You mentioned San Diego, where they want you to watch demonstrators who could be dangerous, uh, and, and yeah. they, they used it there. And then you you, you quote Meredith Mingeldorf, uh, who is the spokesperson for um, the the agency itself for the Border Patrol, saying Elba technology is a force multiplier for them. Uh, and it, which is really military jargon when you look at it and think about this huge force of 61,000 employees, 60, $16 billion budget, um, and can think of itself in some ways as a military for, uh, uh, force. And I think that's something we don't think about as well. And let me just th- let's think about that, but let's look at this Jay Stanley quote you have in your article. Jay Stanley of the ACLU, Jay Stanley is a senior policy analyst with the uh, ACLU's uh, Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Uh, and he said in your article, quote, the border is the natural place for the government to start using them, surveillance material, since there is much more public support to deploy these sorts of intrusive technologies there. Um, and so, you know, when you look at this stuff, this is, they're getting involved in this because there's a real danger about how this technology can be used, where it can go, they're already expanding it. So talk a bit about that and, and the kind of things that you, you yourself want to question given the work you just did. Yeah, I mean, uh, deploying the integrated fixed tower project, for example, provides an opportunity for these technologies to be further refined and and for um, through developing you know new forms of expertise and 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 studying the technology, um, it becomes easier to use elsewhere. You know, the cost comes down, more people become proficient at it. Uh, it also helps to normalize the use of this technology. I mean, um, you know, who could imagine? 20 years ago, the use of this kind of technology on, you know, U.S. domestic soil, as it were. Um, but because of, you know, the sorts of political changes that have happened in our society in the last 20 years, uh, this is happening and, and there's not widespread outrage about it. it. It's It seems almost normal to many people that this would happen, right? So, so that, you know, one of the aspects of this story is that, yes, there's this... Um, Creeping, you know, technological proto-fascist, you know, kind of kind of society being t- tested out in the borderlands, where everyone is potentially subject to surveillance at all times in in incredibly intrusive ways, and you know, it's it's sort of if you look at it in a historical context, you know, very fitting that this sort of technology is is being used on a indigenous yep. reservation where you know the people who predominantly live there are an indigenous population. Um, you know, indigenous people in in many cases have been the canaries in the coal mine of, of technologies that are that are later used more broadly in society. Uh, so that is that is something to be aware of in, in the case of this technology. Well, well Parrish, I want to thank you for the work you put out for The Intercept. This is a really an important article, I think. You've done some really great work here connecting the dots. Thank you for taking the time to join us here on The Real News. Look forward to many more conversations with you. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you so much for having me on. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you for joining us. Let us know what you think. Take care. Thanks a lot for watching. 
appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.